Why hello lovely humans, Jen Foxbot here for another edition of Math Mondays. Da 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 da. Yeah! All right! So glad that you are uh, joining me today. In this episode, we will be talking about Fourier series. Yeah! So we are finally ready to tackle this fairly complex mathematical topic. Um, so uh, to appropriately cover all of the cool and important things to understand and wield the power of Fourier series, I want to break this uh, this video into three parts. So in the first part, we will talk about, well, why Fourier series? Why do we need them and how are they useful? Um, and then we'll look at the general form of a Fourier series. So that's part one. Part two, we will look at how to um, apply uh, boundary conditions, a uh, little loose there because uh, sine and cosine repeat forever, so there aren't really any boundaries. But there's a cool way that we can rethink our boundary conditions, in quotes, <laughs> um, so that we can actually find the coefficients of a Fourier series, just like we did with power series. So that's part two. And then in part three, we will look at a specific example on how we expand a perhaps uh, complicated function or a function that is difficult uh, to program. And we will look at how we can use a Fourier series to break down that function into a series of sines and cosines. Super cool. All right. So why Fourier series? Um, well, personally, my favorite application of Fourier series is one that we are all familiar with. We, you're using a Fourier, or you're, you're hearing me because of the application of Fourier series. So Fourier series is the mathematical technique that engineers and other folks use to break down sound and uh, create a digital signal out of this really cool physical phenomenon. So how does this work? Well, okay, let's look at a tuning fork, because a tuning fork, uh, I'm going to draw this very simply. <laughs> this is my tuning fork. Very cool. It looks like a little pitchfork. Um, but a tuning fork uh, plays a pure tone. So uh, when you hit the tuning fork, the tuning fork vibrates, and my hand is moving a lot slower than that vibration. The vibration happens a little bit faster than we can see, but we can hear the results, which is super cool. So as the sides of the tuning fork move back and forth, they push against air molecules. So when this side pushes, um, when it moves this way, it pushes the air molecules and it squishes them together. When it moves back, it creates a little bit less pressure and then it does that again. So it's like squishing, not squishing, squishing, not squishing. It's a very technical term, squishing. So the resulting uh, air pressure wave, you could represent kind of like this, where maybe these lines are representative of groups of air molecules. So as the tuning fork squishes them, they get closer together. And then as it moves away, they get uh, less close. So you could say that this is a region of high pressure. I'm going to say pressure because I'm lazy. And this is a region of low pressure, low P. Um, and so if we were to measure the pressure over time, as I flip my page very casually, um, we would get a uh, formula that looks like this. So pressure over time equals A times sine of, I do not have this one memorized, 2 pi over the wavelength of the pressure wave um, times uh, the, the space or the, yeah, the space that we are looking at or the location of the wave that we are looking at minus the velocity of the wave times the time at which we are looking at our wave. And so in this case, um, the pressure is actually a function of x and t, which makes sense, right? Because uh, the sound wave is going to sound different depending on where we are as well as when we are. Pretty cool, right? So we can use mathematics to represent this complex phenomena of a sound, which is really just an air pressure wave. Okay, so that's pretty cool, right? Um, a tuning fork is pretty straightforward. We just really need this one term of sine and we call it good. But wait, not all sounds function like a tuning fork. Uh, for example, a piano. I like to use this example because I've been playing piano for a very long time. Um, and so it was really cool when I learned about Fourier series because it merged my love of music with my love of mathematics. Um, so when we hit a piano key, 
Um, the hammer in the piano uh, that corresponds to that particular key strikes a string in the piano. And just like the tuning fork, the string then vibrates a lot faster than my hand can move. Um, the string vibrates and that vibration also causes the piano to vibrate. Interestingly enough, that vibration of that single string actually um, causes some of the other strings to vibrate. Um, and so um, the string that we hit, or the note that we hit, um, corresponds to the fundamental note, but then layered on top of that are these um, overtones, uh, which are also called harmonics. So if you've ever studied music theory, you'll be like, oh, harmonics, yes, I know what this is. Um, so basically, uh, these harmonics are multiples of the fundamental note. So instead of just a simple um, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure wave, now we have a bunch of things that are layered on top of each other. And I'm drawing that terribly, but you get the idea. Um, and so in order to represent this more complex instrument, we need a little bit more complex approach than just measuring pressure over time, especially because, well, if we measure the pressure over time, we're pretty much gonna get the same thing, right? Because um, since they're multiples of each other, we'll still get the same high and low pressure regions. So how do we do this? Well, we just need to uh, determine the fundamental note, uh, the fundamental tone, and then break it down into the series of harmonics. So this is actually what a Fourier series is. It's super cool. So it basically means that when we expand a function in a Fourier series, we are breaking the function down into individual harmonics and then adding them up from a representative equation, uh, or sorry, adding them up to get a representative equation for this complicated function. Um, and so sometimes this is called harmonic analysis. Okay, so what does this actually look like? I'm gonna erase this now. So we're gonna start simply and assume that the uh, things that we are looking at have a period of two pi. So T is often used to represent a period of two pi. And what this means is that uh, every time we go a distance, or I say distance, but it could also be in time. Every time we go two pi, we get back to the same point we were at. Um, it's kind of like if you were on a Ferris wheel. So you start at the bottom and you go around and we'll call that two pi. So if you go around two pi, you start back where um, you, or you end where you started. Okay. So uh, this is convenient because um, sine of x and cosine of x have a period of 2 pi. Um, you can use Fourier series to represent functions that have a different period uh, uh, besides 2 pi. Uh, if you want me to cover that, I can, but uh, you are totally, once you understand Fourier series, you're totally capable of figuring out how to do that because it's really just running through the math and looking at a few examples and applying the fundamental understanding to a different situation. Uh, so I am confident that you'll be able to do that on your own, given a fundamental understanding. Um, okay, so basically, uh, this also means that sine of nx and cosine of nx are also going to have a period of 2 pi. And n is just an integer multiple, so 1, 2, 3, or even negative 1, 2, 3, etc., etc. Um, and what this means mathematically is that um, if we go around uh, 2 pi or 4 pi or 8 pi, uh, we are always going to get back to the same point. It doesn't matter how many times we've gone around, every time we go a distance of 2 pi or time length of 2 pi, um, then we uh, get back to the same point. And so what this looks like mathematically is that sine of n times, again, but I probably should, x plus 2 pi equals sine of nx plus 2n pi, and this equals um, sine of nx. So uh, adding the factor of 2 pi doesn't make a difference. Uh, it just repeats every time. Doesn't matter where we are. 
Okay, so all of that being said, I'm going to keep that up there because that is a very important assumption. The general form of a Fourier series looks like this, where uh, this is the function that we would expand. And uh, just like with the power series, we're going to have a large number, <laughs> infinite number of terms that we would then um, apply to a specific function and find the details uh, so that our function is representative of the thing that we're looking at. Okay, so the general form is like this, one half a naught plus, remember we need to use sines and cosines because we don't know what we have when we're starting with. We want a general form. So let's start with cosine. So uh, our first coefficient, a one, I guess this is the first coefficient, we'll kind of come back to that when we look at um, the, how to find the coefficients. Um, so a one times cosine of one times x uh, plus a two times cosine of two x plus a three cosine of three x. Okay, you get the picture. Yep. Uh, this is just our n that is increasing by one every time. So that's the cosine part, and then you'd have the plus dot, 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 dot etc, etc. So that would go on forever. Oh my goodness, we don't have time for that. Okay, and then now we need to also include the sine uh, functions so that we can be sure that we have a general formula that can be applied to any periodic function. So let's use a different letter for these coefficients so we can keep the two straight. So we're going to use b because it's the next letter, makes sense. So b1 times sine of 1 times x plus b2 sine of 2x plus b3 sine of 3x and plus dot dot dot. So, okay, you're like, what the heck? So again, um, if this is a little unclear, I would definitely recommend watching the power series video just to kind of wrap your head on like why we're doing this. Um, but also, um, this is really powerful because with this general form, we can use this to find specific values for all of these coefficients and then use that to represent a function that may be really, really difficult uh, to represent in other ways. Um, and a, my favorite example is using this in... Uh, using this to uh, represent a physical phenomena on a computer. What, after I studied physics and then I was working with programming, that was the biggest challenge for me was, well, okay, I know the mathematics, but how do I apply the mathematics to the code? And so this is a way that we can represent physical phenomena with a, um, with, <laughs> Um, a series of equations that are easier to put into code than would be the physical phenomena. So what we would do is the exact same way that we um, worked out the power series equation. We apply boundary conditions, which allow us to kind of um, cut down on the number of terms that we need, and then we determine the values for these coefficients. So um, that's the end of part one. In part two, we will look at how you uh, what these boundary conditions mean. And again, uh, parentheses. Um, since these are repeating functions, there's really no end. Um, but there are uh, very crucial um, uh, things that cosine and sine must adhere to uh, based on their definition. And so uh, we will uh, use those boundary conditions to figure out equations for the coefficients a, n, and b, n, which basically I'll just be like, meh. So these would be a, n, and these would be b, n. Um, okay, and then uh, in part three, we will look at a very specific example. So yeah, I think that there was one more thing I was gonna mention, but I totally forgot, so check out part two. Yeah, okay, bye.